I, I want to maybe encourage people to take action, but I also want to acknowledge, you just mentioned the federal government. I mean, the ta- there, there was a thing called the Green Scare, right, in the early 2000s, I believe, right, where there were all these uh, eco-activists that were labeled as terrorists, eco-terrorists. This was like post-9-11, you know, terrorism is very, it's everywhere and it's bad, you know, and they were using these anti-terror laws uh, to go after environmental activists, people who were engaging in direct action. And, you know, arguably they were engaging in property destruction and things like this, but to call it terrorism or to use the framing of terrorism is a bit of a stretch to say the very least. But these people, some of these people's lives were, I mean, they're thrown in prison for basically, I, I don't even know, for a very, very long time. The tactics used by the FBI uh, are horrifying. So I was just thinking about this in the context of Stop Cop City and some of the ways in which the federal government or the state government, the federal government have been using their resources and their really just, one, just intimidation tactics. I mean, obviously, uh, Tortuguita was murdered by the uh, police, um, but also just other tactics where I think even people who are raising bail funds, like legal funds, were uh, targeted, on, like RICO charges, things like this, right? So all these struggles are happening around different places, and this, there is, an, I mean, I just have to acknowledge that one of the reasons, and I don't think this is the only reason, but one of the reasons why people don't engage in more direct action is because the federal government will come in and they will fuck you up. So I just want to acknowledge that aspect of it, which is I think in order for there to be kind of a, a, a true shift, it's going to require, I think, a lot. Like when you get enough numbers of people, things really do shift and change. But when you have smaller groups of activists, they can be more easily targeted and picked off. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think that's a valid point. Um, and I, that's, of course, their goal, right? They want yeah. people to be so afraid to act that they don't. Uh, and that's the the goal with, I mean, we see this happening as well when um, uh, Virginia and West Virginia with regards to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, people facing mm-hmm. all like incredibly ridiculous charges. Uh, we, of, of course, you mentioned the RICO charges and terrorism charges in Atlanta. I mean, this is this is nothing. Uh, this is nothing new. The, you've got the critical infrastructure laws across the country. Uh, I myself had a warrant out for my for me in um, in Louisiana because of the actions that I took against the Bayou Bridge pipeline when I was literally just standing on an easement. So we mm. there. I mean, this is the mm-hmm. new like this is. They are they are amping up because they know that if this were to continue without them responding, then they would lose a lot of money and a lot of uh, literal ground on this issue. And so I do want to highlight that as an important aspect of it as well, that they are pushing hard back because we are pushing successfully back. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the same time, yes, that doesn't mean that we are winning fights. We lost DAPL. We lost the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. Uh, let's be perfectly honest. We're losing the Mountain Valley Pipeline fight. It's not over, but uh, you know, same thing with with, with Cop City. That fight, I mean, they've already clear cut a lot mm-hmm. of forest down there. So, I, I I say that not to get people down, but to be honest about it, because I think if we just sit here and and, and if I were just to be like, yeah, and let's just keep fighting, I mean, it feels <laughs> dumb. Yeah. Like we yeah, we, yeah. we have to be real with what what we're actually looking at here, and recognize that okay, well then, what tactics have not worked? And why haven't they worked? And if it's if it's tactics like direct action that don't work because people keep being, as you pointed out, fucked up by the government, okay, well then, does that mean that the tactic doesn't work? Does mm-hmm. it mean that we need to somehow do it more underground? Does it mean that we need more people? What? And I'm, I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm just saying that these are questions we have to ask ourselves because obviously things like petitioning the government to do the right thing <laughs> mm-hmm. didn't, has never worked. Uh, and so I think that that's uh, th- that's something that I want to highlight and recognize that the time and, and I think it was a climate scientist that said this to me who had just recently been arrested. And, you know, he was saying, I this is not my thing. I want to be in a lab. I don't want to be mm-hmm. arrested. Uh, I don't like going out and and pro- protesting it makes me very uncomfortable sure but the time has passed for us to be comfortable with the choices we have in regards to mitigating climate chaos that waved by by a long time ago potentially even before i was born 
So, uh, so we have to be really honest about what is required and what we are able to do. I'm not saying that everybody can climb a tree. I myself do not fuck with heights, so I'm not going to be up that tree. I could do ground support, but my ability to do that is also, uh, tempered by the fact that I have a toddler. So it's like, what can I do in this particular moment in my life to be there and for the bioregions that I care about in the ways that are useful uh, and not just performative. I think that that's another important thing. Like a lot of people want to have like the Instagram worthy uh, organizing selfie or whatever. D- d- fuck that. I don't care. Um, it's actually mm-hmm. more powerful if I never see you post a picture of yourself doing activisty shit on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, because the people doing the real shit are the ones that uh, are too busy doing it <laughs> to post mm. about it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that it's important to recognize what we really have to do and how can your skills that you already have or that you're passionate about be used in an important way, whether that's media, whether that's uh, trainings, whether that's childcare or cooking, whatever. Uh, we have, we, there's a need for all of these skills in uh, in a variety of ways on the front lines and the front lines are everywhere because everywhere bioregions are being destroyed. And so it's important to recognize that and to get real about these tactics and also recognize that if somebody wants to do a more militant tactic that you're not comfortable with, cool, don't be a part of it, but don't shit on them for doing it. Uh, right. We ha- Diversity of tactics means that we respect people's use of tactics that we not, might not personally agree with, but that move towards the ultimate goal of uh, of liberation and of saving these spaces. Yeah, for sure. I, I think of um, someone I've had on the podcast a couple of times, Peter Gelderloos, who's an anarchist writer and and has written a really famous book, which was like How Nonviolence Protects the State or something like that. And um, yeah, I think, you know, and contempor- contemporarily, I think what has been proven true is that not in the U.S. specifically, but around the world, Yes, there are different tactics used. Some people are not comfortable using certain things, doing certain things. But the one thing that fucks the movement up is when you have these like protest police types who are like, no, we don't do that here. You know, don't do that. It's like, okay, you don't have to go do that. And maybe that will like not help. But like, you don't, you don't prevent them from doing whatever they feel like they need to do. Like just sort of like acknowledge we're all kind of in the struggle together and we have a common goal. And that's enough. And so I think with, yeah, I think with um, protecting trees, protecting forests, protecting these bioregions, the last of these intact places, there's a lot of ways in which that can be done. And I mean, like, for example, sorry, I just another example came up. I was thinking of militant kind of um, resistance movements, anti-colonial resistance movements. I was thinking of like Nelson Mandela is viewed as this figure of like nonviolent leadership, right? He was like, mm-hmm. Why don't why don't the Palestinians have a Nelson Mandela is what some jackass yeah, on Twitter like probably that. said, right? Why don't they have these like nonviolent leaders to like advocate for that, right? They don't really understand history or understand that Mandela also, and this was done secretly for a while, he was also as part of again, I don't know the history very well, but I do know that on the public facing front, he was like nonviolence, nonviolence, that's end apartheid, while there was this like armed militant faction that was part of the organization that was doing militant shit right they were you know using weapons bombs things like this so again um this isn't an advocacy for those tactics i'm just saying that it was understood in that particular context that was what was needed to 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 kind of heighten contradictions i guess you could say or like heighten the the tensions and the the ways in which this apartheid regime needed to to kind of try to stabilize itself and it couldn't and so eventually it reached a point where, of course, that collapsed in on itself and, and something new could come out of that. So I think that that in and of itself is just, again, in that context worked and it would work in this context as well. There's multiple tactics that need to be used. Yeah. And it's, yeah. again, shifting the psychology. I mean, <clears throat> speaking of apartheid South Africa or speaking of apartheid Israel, uh, I think that, you know, it's important to recognize that this we have been programmed to believe that the state has uh, is allowed to have a monopoly on violence and that we should just shut up and take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, if you look at apartheid Israel or apartheid South Africa or, or really any uh, oppressive regime, then you see that it is a choice of the state to use violence. But those who are using violence as self-defense are condemned to use it. And by that, I mean... They have 
exhausted their options. I mean, BDS is mm. not working. Exports t- from Israel to the United European Union, for instance, have actually risen in the past decade. Uh, if you look at you know the Great March of Return, where they literally just walked. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know anything more peaceful than just going for a walk. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was unacceptable too. Eldor's children, press, medics were sniped by the IDF. Mm -hmm. I mean, there there is no appropriate way for the Palestinians to be other than dead. And when you look at it in that context then the any kind of violence that is used is a violence of self-defense and a necessity that was not chosen initially it was a it was a it was chosen by uh, a will to survive and so this is also what we look at you know i'm i'm also reminded of the I can't remember his name, Swedish though, uh, how to blow up a pipeline. (laughs) Mm. Uh, You know, these ideas of using like property destruction, which by the way is not violence uh, because violence is against living things and a tractor is not Mm -hmm. living. Sure. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So uh, uh, these kind of tactics seem extreme, but in reality, if we look again at what's being destroyed and if we actually had that kind of relationship with the land, with these ecosystems, then you know, setting a tractor on fire or 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 some kind of earth moving equipment would be hilariously small and insignificant compared to the ex- ongoing extinction of species uh, and yep. rise, you know, floods and droughts. It would be laughable. Oh, you just set something on fire. OK, what's the problem? But yeah, again, right. like that, it's that psychology mm-hmm. that needs to shift uh, in order to in order to actually be real about the tactics that need to be used again if you don't want to if you can't or won't partake in them that's fine but being realistic about the fact that these tactics must necessarily exist uh and that the people who do them are a necessary part of our organizing and our our movements if you if you want to use that word that's an important thing to understand because it comes from the understanding that it's already late, too late to save a bunch of shit. It's already gone. It's it's done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And and so, what do we do to protect what's left? Also, understanding that we can't green our way, we can't just plant a tree, and replace yeah. it. You know, like you've seen the redwoods. You can't just play. You you're gonna give me a fucking sapling and tell me that this is uh, this is gonna replace <laughs> yeah. a two thousand year old tree? Right. Like it's ridiculous mm-hmm. when you really look at it. So again, like the the that stark reality that is really difficult to 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 uh to look at is what we have to look at um and then you know the 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 compounding grief and anger that we feel when we do starkly look at it that is what is processed in these movement spaces as well and as uh, again Cleep and Ali points out that action is prayer and prayer is action um and that's another that's another lesson that I myself have learned from indigenous organizers and, you know, used it in my own kind of Jewish mysticism, witchy way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th- 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 this is uh, this is that unfortunate, uh, inconvenient truth, to borrow the phrase from, <laughs> from that jackass. <laughs> the, real, the real inconvenient <laughs> truth, yeah. yeah.